I Brian, Brian gets very lonely when he's by himself. Yes, I'm I not used this. to. Yeah. <laughs> it's a struggle. It's a struggle. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. You rock. Cheers. All right. So the theme of today is no let up with technology, and you don't let it get to you, right? And that, was, that wasn't the theme, and now uh, Ted's uh, ridiculousness with technology. And uh, oh, it's okay, Samantha. All good. So how's it going, buddy? Uh, it's going good. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm sorry for all the problems. Sorry to keep everybody waiting. But, you know, truth be told, I think most of them are here for you rather than me anyway. Oh, uh, not a chance. You know, so that, that kind of works. And bringing on Amy, that was that was clutch, buddy. I think, like, you probably, like, blew up our audience over that one. Everybody was tweeting out that Amy's there. Yeah, for sure. But excited to finally be here. Love the, love the topic that we're talking about. You know, it's, you know, I, I want people to understand that, at least for me, we're not really talking about selling as in I have something to sell you or a cold car or walking in a store and trying to sell more. We're talking, at least in my opinion, a lot of what we're talking about is selling yourself. You know, how do you build your brand? How do you talk? How do you sell yourself without necessarily selling yourself? How do you, you know, approach people and get them to look at you in, in a certain way so that they want to work with you without saying, buy me? At least that's my perspective. I like to say that I prefer to get bought than to sell. Right. And actually, I think you told me that, like, you know, when I, I think you and I were doing one of our sessions where we were reverse mentoring side. And I was asking you, like, what things you were, you know, working on. And it was, you know, it was kind of a lot of that side of, you know, a little bit of email marketing, a little bit more of, you know, making sure people are seeing a lot of the, the content or speaking things that you're doing so that it's all inbound, right? People, the relationships are built and it's less of you convincing and more of people just wanting to absorb, right? And I think, you know, that takes a whole lot of time, but I think that part of it works in all different arenas. Because to me, part of it also, getting, getting sold also includes getting noticed, right? And I think too many people right now are still in that mentality where they have to sell themselves to get noticed. But I think ultimately, if they provide value out the gate and they share, and that's where my show you care thing came from was like, when, I sh when you show you care, that's where you actually provide the value where someone wants to buy from you without you having to sell. Uh oh, did I lose you? Okay, something weird is going on now. Hold on. Whoa, that was like Inception. You're like, boop, now he's gone. Welcome back, Ocasio G. Welcome back to the... Yep, freaky. It's Freaky Friday. It's not even Halloween Friday. Friday Halloween Friday is coming up. Build up your relations. Be yourself. Share your knowledge. Boom. That's a good one. Uh-oh. We're back to the Ted heartbeat. Have I heard about Facebook mobile where you can purchase from within the app? Yes, I love that idea. Um, all right. So, yeah, so part of this conversation is really about – we're talking about, you know, this idea of, you know, selling, but selling in the, in a way, in a sense. And, you know, and I'm learning this too, because I think, and I, Amy, who was in here earlier, we could have had Amy, I could have just talked to Amy about this because she can give insights on this too. But, you know, there's lots of lessons learned. There's people that sell too much and are too much in your face. There's also other people that don't take advantage of the data or the time or the opportunity, and they don't have something for someone to buy when they've built all that rapport build all that conversation and are the people are ready to pull the trigger. Right. So I think part of this conversation really comes down to, you know, knowing your story, knowing what you're about and then having something so someone can buy when you, so you don't have to sell yourself. So, uh, I mean, Ted, can you elaborate a little bit on that too, on how you've kind of built that up over time as well? Well, you know, I think you just made a very important point when you said to me, can you talk about that, how you've built that up over time? I think what happens is most people are just, they're, they're too much in a rush. You know, look, we've become a society where um, you get a lot of immediate satisfaction. I mean, or, you know, you, you text someone, you expect an answer back immediately. You email them or, or half the people don't even respond to their emails because they're too busy responding on other channels. Um, and, and again, because of that, we've seen also so much early success. People that start businesses and, and literally become wealthy overnight. It's such a small fraction, but it's a major majority of the news. In other words, the news doesn't talk about so-and-so just failed, so-and-so just failed. I mean, then it would be the typical 99.9% to 0.1%. What we only hear about is the successes. So everybody wants it to happen overnight. And you know, a lot of that goes to the whole 
you know, people say that millennials are in such a rush. Part of it is because it's 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 their environment. It's it's what they're experiencing. It's what they're seeing. But when you're looking to build, whether it's a brand or it's your personal brand or you're looking to sell something, it takes time to do that. It takes time to to get. Um, exposure. It takes time to get some leverage and some traction. It takes time for people to notice you. And, you know, it's like anything else. If you take a shortcut, then you risk what comes along with certain shortcuts, you know, and you risk um, pushing too hard, uh, um, promoting yourself too much, too many humble brags, you know, and then there's also ways to do humble brags. When someone says, I'm posting this, but I don't mean it as a humble brag. Yes, they do. OK, so, you know, I do it the opposite way. I go, I'm I'm, I'm locking in my humble brag here. And, right. I, and I so if, if you want a humble brag, humble brag. But don't say you're not humble bragging here. Don't say it's an accident or don't say it's not a humble brag. It's the facts. I mean, facts or not. I mean, bragging doesn't mean that you're not telling the truth. Bragging usually means if you're doing it properly, that you're bragging about something you have accomplished. Um, so again, I, I'm not saying there's not a place for that at certain times in certain ways for certain reasons, but what, what I'm saying to you is it's like any other kind of selling. If you ram it down someone's throat, it's going to make it, it's going to, it's going to hurt your reputation. It's going to get you some sales in the short term. It's not going to get you sales in the long term. It's not going to build relationships. It's not going to build sales that are going to last. It's not going to build sales where people are totally comfortable with what they're buying, whether it's you they're buying or a product that you're, that, that you're selling to them. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with also with budgets. I mean, yep. look, if you're a company that's going public or that has VC money behind it and you have millions of dollars to spend on your advertising, you could ramp that up really quickly. But if you're looking to, you know, put out content, get people to notice it, you've got to do it. You've got to do it a lot. You've got to do it regularly. You've got to do it consistently. And that takes time and a lot of hard work. And you have to really recognize that in the beginning and be prepared for it. It's, you know, it's really just that simple. It's like anything else. I mean, you know, you want to build a following. You're not going to build it overnight. If you want to go out and buy Twitter followers, then you buy them and you understand that you're not going to accomplish much with them because they're not real followers. If you're willing to take the time and there are ways to speed that up with more hard work, with following people to get them to follow you back, with creating, with, with then presenting them with value good content, good engagement, then people are going to talk about you. They're going to share it. And, it, you know, to me, that's what that whole concept um, uh, that we've been talking about is about. That's about selling um, without selling your soul. No, you know? I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, part of what you were saying there also is like having an idea. And I don't know if everybody saw it. I'll drop the link in here. But uh, Jeff, the CEO of LinkedIn, uh, interviewed Oprah and it, they posted like part one of three um, yesterday. And it's actually a really good uh, article. I watched it last night. And all of her conversation was about intention and her failures. But she was, Oprah was actually talking about her early days. And um, she had just got on the air and it was doing a couple of things. And, and her goal and focus was selling herself so that she could be the backup anchor to the backup for the local Chicago uh, broadcasting. And the person, her agent came back and said, I pitched you. They said, they already got a black person. We don't need you. And she ended up firing that agent. But then she shifted her, her focus and her intention into what do I want people to, to know about me? Or what do I want people to take away so that when I am selling myself or when I'm not selling myself, the ultimate thing is I'm building that entire story. So I don't have to sell that that's the anchor position that I want, but my body of work leads me to that. And I actually thought it was perfect, like kind of, you know, segue into what we were talking about here, because I mean, it's Oprah. So there's, we're going to put this in perspective, Oprah's success. And, but I thought she was very, it was a really great interview. Just hearing her talk about when she shifted to what everything she was doing, how to have intention. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Ted? Well, it look, it's, it's all these actors we know. They, you know, we only, you know, we, we notice them when they have tremendous success. But how cool is it when you see them in movies where you had no idea who they were? Clint Eastwood is in so many old um, um, Western and, and war movies that there, was, there were other people that we all knew, whether it was Rock Hudson or, 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 or Cary Grant or, or, or um, so many others. And I'm, not, I'm really not good with actors' names. But um, um, I was just watching a movie with Eddie Murphy and Martin Short the other night on Late Night TV. I was up late like you were, Brian. I was working really late. I always have the TV on in the background. And there was this movie with Martin Short and uh, – not Martin Short. That's the um, – um, who's the uh, other black actor? He's a short – he was in um, Bad Boys with uh, Will Smith. Um, Martin, uh, Martin Lawrence. Lawrence. Martin Lawrence. So it was Martin Lawrence and Eddie Murphy, and they were these two guys that went to prison back in Prohibition days. And I'm looking at the cast, 
And all these guys with these bit parts are like the famous black actors today, or the guys that are actually now getting older and aren't even the famous guys anymore, but they were nobodies in that movie. They had small bit parts because most of these guys, most of the actors, whether it's George Clooney or, or, or you're talking about, I mean, look at Ellen. You remember the stuff Ellen used to do? Or do you know Eddie Murphy was a comedian at, at comedy shops in Long Island? Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, when I was growing up in the 70s, Eddie Murphy was this comic, you know, performing at these small little places with an audience of, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 people. And, and, and I remember seeing Richard Belzer. You know, I don't know if you know Richard Belzer. He's on Law and Order now. He plays yes. one of the detectives. Richard Belzer used to, used to work at one of the comedy stores, one of the comedy shops in the city. Uh, I forgot which one it was called. And he was the announcer. He wasn't even performing half the time. He was the guy introducing the comics. So, you know, we, we don't remember them and know them like that, whether it's celebrities, whether it's business people, whether it's the guys who are CMOs or CEOs of most companies, they started as interns. Right. You know, they, they started as as just basic employees, as managers, even even the guys that went and got MBAs from Harvard, they didn't start as CMOs. You know, most of them start as directors somewhere. And it takes a lot of hard work. It takes recognition. It takes, you know what it really takes? It takes execution and delivery. So, you know, you want to get people to follow you, but if you don't execute and deliver after you do that, then you're, you know, first of all, then you can even ruin your brand. I mean, you know, I like to say a brand is what a brand is what a business or a person does. A reputation is what people remember. So I can say all day long that I'm a marketer or that I care about people or whatever it is. But if I don't go out and perform it and do it every day, especially in this world, there was a, there was a day where you could you could have a brand that wasn't really you. You could you could acquire a persona that wasn't you. But here that's going to get found out. Because yep. people are going to see your replies, your comments, somewhere else. They're going to bump into you somewhere. And guess what? You're going to be in a bar screaming at a waitress. And someone's going to get you on video. And it's going to appear. And it's not even like it used to be. Videos only appeared on YouTube. Now they're appearing everywhere. Right. You know, and, and then people are going to say, what's the deal with that? What is he pissed off at? Because the waitress spilled his drink by mistake after somebody tripped her and he went off on her or the flight attendant asked him not to put his bag up top because there was no room and he went and he went off on her or he had to get thrown off the plane. So, you know, and, and, and then the other side of that is, you know, when you make I mean, all of us can lose it, can have a bad day, can do anything. But then talk about, it. you know, be willing to say I made a mistake, you know, like uh, like I said, you know, we talked about this on one of the earlier shows. I recently did a video about um, dad bloggers being complainers. And and they got me in their community in a discussion. And they were, like, amazed that I wasn't there to apologize. Right. Um, you know, I thought about what I said. I, I believed in what I said. What I did was get a different perspective on how they were viewing it. But my opinion still stood. What I learned a little bit was maybe there might have been a better way to express it. Or maybe I needed to see it a little bit more from their angle. Although even after all of that, I still think they're whiners and complainers. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, also that's not fair because it's not all dad bloggers. It's, it's just a certain community of them. There are a lot of them out there working hard, doing great work, delivering great content, you know, and just kind of ducking and bobbing and weaving away from the reputation that some of the more vocal people in their group are doing. And that happens with all of us, right? I mean, think about it. So you're out there, Brian, doing your thing, working your butt off. And then there are people out there saying, well, you know, there's those millennials online. There's that whole crew of guys on social and a lot of them put each other down or they're complainers. And you're staying clear of that, but you still get, you know, uh, you still get painted with the same brushstroke. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, we've had conversations like this. And my answer to, to most people that is just keep doing what you're doing. You know, you, and you might not get recognition today. You might not get recognition tomorrow, but people who are who care are going to be observing you. They're going to watch what you're doing. They're going to see who you're talking to, how you're behaving, what people are saying about you, and be willing to relax, take a breath, and realize that you might not fix that reputation overnight. It might take a little bit of time, but how do you do it? You do it by being consistent, by delivering value, and by caring about the people who you're talking to. You know what? I think, you know, we had Amy who stepped in earlier. I think Amy is a perfect example. You know, some people might look at what Amy has done and I, and Amy only came on my radar probably two years ago. Um, but you know, there, there'd be a little bit of look of like overnight success or she came out of nowhere yet she, this Wednesday, she's celebrating her 500th episode of our YouTube show. 500, 500. Yes. That's 500 episodes. <laughs> So, I mean, like, if you look at it from that perspective, the accolades and the things that the, the success and the people that are willing and wanting to buy from Amy and are, are kind of knocking down her door to hire her and have her speak and do all those things today, 
all those 400 and you know 10 episodes I bet before things started getting that ball rolling was consistency, delivering value, knowing that you had a value. Ultimately, she was selling herself that entire time by putting out quality crap for so long that eventually when when she you do get noticed, now the right hooks are coming and you just continue doing what you're doing. So I think I mean it's a big shout out to her cuz I I think oftentimes, especially Amy and I have been bucketed in the same bucket in multiple arenas where they say, you're the new breed of speakers that showed up overnight. And you're like, not a chance. We've been working our ass off since, you know, early 2000. It, we just didn't get on your radar until the more recent time. It's not meaning that we weren't working our ass off the entire time. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and a lot of this has to do with, you know, look, you, we get pushed by everybody to do it faster by ourselves, but also by people around us, people that say you're not getting enough recognition, you see it more, or you're working at a company and they want more to happen faster, or they think that the only way to sell is to be openly selling. So, you know, I went through this a lot. I went through this at Elf. I went through this at Open Sky. I went through this really strongly at Collective Bias when I was building their brand. And every time I spoke, I'd get a call from the, from the majority investor in the company saying, you know, we're not going to let you speak anymore if you don't start mentioning, have at least five slides about Collective Bias. And by the way, um, for the last uh, year and a half, I was with Collective Bias. I would not take his phone calls. So um, <laughs> because I said, well, you know, guess what? You, you, I'm not going to speak for you guys if I have to put up five slides with case studies when that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to build your brand by talking about important things in the industry, important things with re relation to what I believe in social media. And then but every time I do that, your name's going to be attached to it. Your name's going to be on the slides. You know, that that is old fashioned sponsorship and branding. And that works well you know okay. and, and i you know i robert scoble is someone i've always kind of uh, put on a pedestal from my world of the tech space and what he was doing as an evangelist and and microsoft and, and now at rackspace and it was funny because i was at the event with him last week we were both speaking and uh, he had a rackspace shirt on but it was just a red shirt with the r on the side mm. and he got up there and he was doing an internet of things conversation and he was uh, virtual reality he's going all this thing and someone uh, was interviewing him on his last part and like, oh, you know, uh, you know, Robert, I probably need to talk to you about Rackspace because I need to move my stuff to the cloud. And they had this conversation and Robert very, you know, very easily did a good job of going like, hey, I'm not here to talk about Rackspace. I'm here to talk about the stuff that the experiences that you guys care about. When you realize you want to host or, uh, or a provider, you're going to go to Rackspace. I'm not here to sell you on that. And he did a great job. And for me, it was like a little slew of foot and he does it as a professional, you know, and there's people that do it really well. But from there's a, that's, that value to that brand, it takes a lot of work to get a brand to understand that value and to respect you like that. But I can guarantee the amount of people that build a relationship and learn and, and, and are attached to him, ultimately that purchase and buy from Rackspace and trust Rackspace only because of what he did of never selling them on Rackspace, only you know delivering his thought leadership and and his his value across the board, and you know and that even comes in a polarizing way, good and bad, right? So I think it, it can kind of go both ways with that as well. Well, well you know that goes it, it, that wraps itself really well into the whole selling yourself into the influencer space because that's really what it's about when people trust you and they see a name that's attached to you, and, and if you get a reputation that you don't associate yourself with companies or names that you don't believe in that you don't think the product is good, then people say, well, you know. If Ted's working there or Brian's working there or, or, or if, if any of these guys are working there, then they must really believe in the company. Now, I do want to say something right now to you and to your f friends at Blab, since I know that you talk to those guys. They've got to fix this problem for me because I cannot sit here holding a freaking phone <laughs> <laughs> doing I know. this. I, you know, I need, actually, I need to talk to my friends. Actually, know what you need. Look at this bad boy. My friends over at Archon Mounts, they sent me this and I can set my tripod. I can put it, set it on there and it's weighted stand. That's what, that's what you need. Well, I, I just got mine. I finally got it to sit like on my laptop, like I'm leaning it up against the laptop. But still, for me, it's just not the same view. Uh, I, I don't know. We've got to get we've got to figure out how to fix the situation before next week. So, no. So, so Ted, you brought up a good question. And this is one that, you know, for me, I, with what I'm doing and trying to pivot and kind of looking at all these different options, you know, there's something out there where, you know, people are uh, the whole idea. You're not an overnight success, but there's also comes into a fact where 
you don't just become a thought leader. You don't become an influencer just because you said so, just because you put it in your bio. But there is an art. There is a uh, a knack for doing that. You know, our friend, a lot of our friends, uh, mutual friends, were at TED at IBM yesterday. So we got, you know, if we, you and I had our entire Facebook feed and our entire Instagram <laughs> feed full of, you know, Brian Kramer and Joel Kamm and Warren Whitlock and all those guys having a grand old time at the IBM event. But so much of what that whole idea, whoa. Tongue fell. <laughs> I was like exactly. riding on a ride with you, but I'm curious. You know, like a lot of people ask me the question. I'm like, what do I need to do to get recognized as an influencer? And I think that's a question that is not usually addressed head on because then you hear a lot of things like, you know, very high level. And, and so I'm curious what, when you get that, that question, like, Hey, how did you gain the influence, the audience, the community that you have that allows you to sell, allows you to be sold upon and ultimately has P has brands wanting to invest in you. I mean, you do a lot, you connect CMOs with CMOs daily. But the reason you're able to connect CMOs with CMOs daily is you have trust and a relationship on both sides of that fence that gives you influence in many different areas. So I'd love to hear you kind of talk a little bit about that kind of concept. Well, you know, I think it goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier in that it's about, first of all, you have to gain experience. This doesn't happen overnight. It has to do with the companies you've worked for, things you've done, um, who you've worked with, what you've accomplished. Um, and then, you know, for me, I've, I've always built relationships. I mean, I used to call it networking. Uh, I've realized what I was really, I was networking, but what I was really doing was community building because I've always introduced people. I, you know, a, a good buddy of mine in Silicon Valley, Raj Seti. Um, I, you might know Raj. I'm not sure yeah. if you yep. know. He's a, yep. he's a serial entrepreneur. Ra, one of Raj's latest things is, is convincing people that what they should be doing every day is connecting people. They should have a goal of connecting 300 people um, a month or a year or whatever the number is they have as a goal. And for me, that's something I've always done. And when I was sitting in one of Raj's talks about this, I started sitting there just counting, trying to think of, I wonder who I've connected this week. And, you know, my numbers went so beyond what he was talking about as an ultimate connector because it's just something I do without even thinking about it. I mean, I connected four people just this morning um, off of conversations or somebody, do you know anybody here? Or do you know somebody we can interview for this? Or we're looking for somebody to help us with something. And when you do that, you're, you're building your network, you're building communities, you're building people that trust you and think of you in a certain way. And then look, these days you really, I believe you've got to publish, uh, you know, and by the way, that publishing can be making blabs every day and then republishing those blabs, you know, uh, uh, putting them on your blog, making them available for people to see and read, uh, uh, to see and share. But also, you know, what I love about, you know, um, platforms like Twitter and Instagram is that it allows for media, immediate connection. I mean, I love Facebook. I, I, I hear people you know, put it down Facebook all the well. time. And, you know, I, I love the connectivity, the discussions, the, 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 um, the engagement I get on Facebook. Um, uh, I, I don't think I use LinkedIn enough. I think there's a lot of value there. So what I, I try to do is, is put out my content everywhere. So I syndicate everything. I create a lot of content. I repurpose a lot of content. I use my content again and again. Here's another thing. People say, how do you create so much content? Well, you can use content over and over and over again. I mean, you write a blog post. You turn a blog post into four blog posts. Or you turn it into four Facebook posts. You take a paragraph. I go back to old blog posts all the time. And I post paragraphs from them to spark conversation or get people talking. Um, I, if I want a lot of comments, I don't, put, I don't put things on my blog. I put them on Facebook. I take the comments from Facebook and I either I either screenshot them or cut and paste them and put them into the blog. I don't do that so that there'll be conversations in the blog. I do that so when people go to the blog, they can experience the conversation or the engagement that happened on my Facebook page because people are much more apt to engage on a Facebook page. I mean, even you look at the most commented on blogs, in general, they're comments without responses. They're not discussions, they're comments. So somebody that, you know, and there are a lot of bloggers out there that get a lot of comments. So they'll put out a post and they might even get a, a few hundred of them. But all in all, for the most part, there's very little conversation among the, the people who are commenting on the blog. And, and you get a lot more of that via Facebook. You know, I'd like to see it a lot. I think LinkedIn needs to make some improvements because I think a lot of that could be happening at LinkedIn. Right. But, but we don't have the capability of doing it. We can't edit our comments after we make them like you can on Facebook. So when you make mistakes or, or you change your mind or you think of, I wanted to add more to that. You, you Sometimes it comes in a different flow of the conversation and, and it's not as easy to do. But um, if you involve yourself in these things and you, here's another great tip. If you want to build a brand for yourself, start commenting on very 
um, um, well-visited blogs. So I comment regularly, not as much as I used to, but I did a lot in the early days on media, on media posts, on a whole bunch of different of their posts, on Business Insider, on Harvard Business Review, on Forbes, in all the business sections, um, on HuffPo, on, on Mashable. I mean, I don't know. Shit, do you hear about anything about Mashable anymore? I don't hear much about They're Mashable. doing good in live streaming. Actually, Mashable is kicking ass in live streaming. But some of you said, Ted, you know, and for me, you know, uh, this influencer conversation is something I live with every day. It's kind of like in, been my, uh, you know, a lot of my work uh, recently, not only as an influencer, but working with brands to identify and then help them create great content. But on, our, on the show I do on Mondays, the Social Business Hour show, we kind of broke down and we were really broke down influencers into three types. And I see some people going... Uh, having conversations about number of followers and, and those kind of things. And we broke down the influencer actually comes in three forms. And, and I want to kind of explain this. I think it, it does a great job of, of simplifying the conversation. An influencer, a thought leader is a type of influencer. A social amplifier is a type of influencer. And an expert in their field or in their craft is a type of influencer. They all three are unique types of influencers. They all three require unique identification. And they all three have a unique value proposition to their brand, right? So I don't believe you need 100,000 followers to be an influencer for a brand. But if you are not the one that's giving them a broad reach, you either have to be the one that gives them depth on the topic or the one that is the thought leader in the sense of you are the focal point where they're going for. So that's kind of how we were kind of bucketing it. It seems to drive that conversation because I was always the one that said, screw the number of followers. You don't need that. I mean, and then I started realizing when I would do influence as myself and I didn't align myself with people that had a lot of followers, I wasn't able to get the message out where I needed it. And, and, and me as being a, trying to be an expert in the field. And I, I quickly realized that it's a, it's a three-part team and you really need for a great brand to do great influencer marketing, which equals that great selling that we're talking about here, is I think ultimately you need all three of those people and you need to understand that. And I think the great people actually connect those dots, right? So I believe part of my value proposition for brands is I can connect you with the, with the social amplifiers, the experts, and I work alongside and I'm very lucky to co-host shows with the thought leaders, right? And so to me, it, it's a little bit of that, what you're talking about, where it's not only being the connector and building trust with your audience, but understanding what type of influencer you are or you want to be, and then kind of honing your focus there. Because like you said, commenting, I mean, Medium, if you guys don't go to medium.com, but Medium's kind of that new form mm -hmm. for blogging, the amount of click-through, I, I mean... I was 80% two days ago, 80% of my web traffic was off of that, off of medium. As good as I am on social, as good as I do all of these things, 80% of my web traffic came directly off of medium. And it's not because of my post, but it was, I was commenting and, co and you can inline comment. You can comment after blog posts. And I spent a lot of time going into startups and these influencer marketing conversations and really commenting inside of medium because it's rich and raw. You can go, kind of go back and forth. But like you said, early days of Forbes and a lot of that stuff that was going on, that my people were reading what I was doing and either trusting it or wanting to learn more and then wanting to find out more compared to a tweet that might get lost in the noise. So I think to me, I think that was something that as soon as you said that, I was laughing because I was like, wow. I mean, I had a huge spike in traffic and it all had to do with one site and all I was doing was commenting. I wasn't even adding my own content that day. No, I, absolutely. I mean, it's, and it, it builds your reputation. And also a lot of these, remember that when you comment somewhere, your name stays there. So anytime somebody goes to the post, look, it's one of the reasons Seth Godin doesn't allow comments on his blog because right. he's not because Seth gets so many visitors that if you were the first commenter on his blog every day, you'd get viewed by everybody that comes there. I mean, you, there'd be a lineup of people trying to comment on his blog or make sure to be somewhere where they get noticed. And believe me, that's a big reason why he doesn't allow comments. You know, he says it says he doesn't really want your opinions. And that's probably true, too. Um, uh, but it, it, what would it matter if it took up this space underneath? It's because he doesn't want you building your brand off of his work. But most of these others, I mean, but also realize that on media post on when you do comment, do not expect to get answered. None of these authors ever reply to your comments. You can ask questions. You can offer to buy something. You can tell them you want to hire them for God's sake, because you want to know why they never even go back and look because all they are is strict content producers. The majority of people that post on at least what I found, at least the people whose posts, I guess I'm commenting on, 
on Business Insider, on on um, on especially on Media Post. I mean, it's almost impossible to get a reply there. But what you're doing is you're getting your voice out in front of their entire audience. They've spent all this money and all this time building the audience, and you're getting your voice. And by the way, the same goes for Facebook. You know, you go and comment on things that Robert Scoble saying, that, that Scott Stratton saying, that Gary Vaynerchuk is saying. You're getting your name out there in front of other people. So understand. The next step is when they come to check you out, they have to, there has to be some, some, some meat there. There has to be something about who you are, what you do, give them a good place to land, make sure that they're landing something to someplace that tells people who, who you up. Oh, there we go again, who you are, and who you are and what you do. Um, and then, you know, there's another thing, Brian, when you were talking about, you know, the parts of being an influencer, don't forget that. It's also about who your audience is well beyond just other thought leaders or other people in the space. There are consumers. I mean, and then who is the audience of your audience? So if you're being retweeted, if your content's being shared, who is it being shared to? Um, so in that case, you can get someone who's only got 200 followers. But if those 200 followers are 200 people who have 200,000 followers each, whose people live and breathe by what they put out there, you know, like, so, it, you know, and then there's the other. Well, hold on. I want to I wanna, I wanna expand on that real quick because I, I think there's kind of a funny story here and it has to do with me and you is that people, all, you know, I hear that question all the time. You know, Brian, how did you get on these people's radars? How did you get the attention of thought leaders? And no, it wasn't overnight success. But one of my direct strategies when I was working on my personal brand and switching my my focus was I wanted to know who influenced the influencer. And I wanted to build strategic relationships with those middle group of people. So I knew I couldn't get on Ted Rubin's radar, but just tweeting him once or twice, yes, you're going to reply. But that doesn't mean I'm adding value and not worth spending my time. So what I strategically did was I found, the like you said, the two people that had 200 followers, people that had 5,000 followers that were, that were listening and, and being heard by the thought leaders that I wanted to target. And, and the question came in here, Pizza on the Cheap just asked, you know, quantity uh, over qu uh, quality. And I think that's not what we're saying here. What we're actually saying is make sure you're being able to be found and heard. And oftentimes it includes commenting and engaging where their audience is as much as where your audience is. I use the term upcycle, which means every blog post I create, it goes into many different things. So three days after it goes live on my blog, it goes on the medium. Three days later, it goes on the LinkedIn Pulse a publisher. I then take the graphic and put it on the Pinterest. If it's really doing good, I'm going to create an infographic about it, and I'm going to post the infographic. If it's great still, I'm going to turn it into a slide share. And it's all one great piece of content, but I'm getting it out to my audience in as many different forms as possible. And ultimately, hopefully, not repeating myself, I am tweaking things. But I this I, idea of upcycling, I mean, if you guys look at my blog post today, that the blog post I posted today on Medium it's already been five places where I've kind of tweaked and, and massaged it, but ultimately it hasn't been like repeated or drowned out. And so I think that's part of the, the kind of conversation across the board. Yeah. I, and I, I turn all my blog posts into tweets. Yep. I mean, I go to my blog posts and I, I turn one liners, I turn sentences to tweets. And then by the way, I save all those tweets. Anytime I write an original content tweet about something I'm thinking about, whether it's marketing or whatever it is, all these things you hear me say, whether it's relationships like muscle tissue, whether it's about more facilitation, less fabrication, those those were all tweets at one time that I saved. I save all of those and I use them again and again and again. So people, please, when you're, whether you're selling or you're building your brand or you're trying to build, sell yourself or sell yourself without selling, remember that repetition is really important. And, and, I, and I have to say this over and over because I hear all the time, oh my God, that content was already used. So it's called reach and frequency, people. Yeah, and you know what? And give another thing to Amy here. Amy had one of her videos popped up in my feed like Monday of this week. And the title caught me and I, I clicked it. And I'm watching the video and, it, and it, it literally sparked something. I took a note down. I went over to my website. I was changing it. And then I went back to find the video and it was like, she's on episode 500 coming up. And I think it was like episode like 331 that she had, it was back in my feed and it still provided me amazing value. And I think that's something that I think is uh, underestimated on really that repurposing and kind of refreshing. And, and even yesterday, IBM reposted one of my posts where it said, you know, five secrets to, uh, to standing out when you're live tweeting at an event. And all of a sudden I got posted and it went like wildfire. And all these people were like, Brian, these are great tips. And I was like, 
wow, I haven't posted that like in a year. That, like that was a, a fault on mine. But I open up the seat below. If you guys want to jump and ask your questions about this kind of conversation, love to hear you guys. We, we got on a little bit late, so maybe we'll stick around for a well, little bit longer than we did before. Two, but two, two things I want to mention, because I saw two questions come across the board earlier on. One of them is, I think some people came in late and wanted to know why I couldn't be, I couldn't use my laptop and I had to use my iPhone just because I was having some technical difficulties with Blap. So that's why I mentioned that. And then Angie mentioned about the problems with the LinkedIn um, app that it's different from LinkedIn on the site. And there, you know, there, it, it is a lot harder to use a lot of times. A lot of times I wait until I'm on my laptop uh, to use LinkedIn. So I just want to acknowledge that that, that is an issue, but, uh, and there I go again, I'm just trying not to have to hold up this iPhone the whole time. Um, so, and one other thing is remember, there are also people who are influencers who don't have to have an audience. It's just that their credibility when they make a statement, if you repeat it, if you quote it, there's value to it. So if they quote it about your product, your brand, or about you, I mean, Malcolm Gladwell, this is not a guy that's out there building a social presence, but he's a brilliant guy who's a brilliant thought leader. I mean, you know, Seth Godin certainly has a huge audience, but not via social. He doesn't really give a shit, you know, because if he says it, he knows people are going to value it and share it. And, you know, and, and that kind of goes towards like the whole Apple approach to, to social where they don't have their own presence. They let other people have the presence for them because their products are that good. So did, were you going to take some questions? Did you want to bring somebody else yeah, in here? Feel free to jump on, if anybody wants to, that's watching, want to jump in the seat, uh, feel free to, you know, and, and really this whole conversation about selling yourself or selling versus I mean, ultimately providing value out of the gate. And I mean, it goes back to, to Ted's book, the first book that I read that really resonated with me, which was Return on Relationship. So a little what you can, when you can. Go ahead. No, no let up right there. No, no let, let up, up on, baby. No let up on, no let up. You see, when I, when I grow up right there, for me, I'm like lounging in my chair, you know, that lazy millennial. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on right there. I love it. See, taking notes. Okay, we can keep going. Yeah, all right. So who jump? feel free to jump into the, uh, into the seat if you guys are, are, want to ask a question or a comment. Or if you're camera shy and you don't want to jump in the camera, I promise we don't bite. But if you want to jump in here um, uh, in the messages and just use slash Q uh, on the questions, we can do that too. Yeah, go Ted, go Ted. They're counting for you, Ted. <laughs> okay, right, well, we can keep going if you want. Oh, here you go. Art Jones is jumping in. All right, hey, Art. Okay. I, just, uh, I, just saw the, I just saw the title, Role of Content and Selling and Influence, No Let Up, and the push-ups, you said it all. No <laughs> you know, you know uh, so two friends of mine um, uh, started, they wrote a book called What You Can, When You Can. And, you know, I got to tell you, most of and it's about working out. It's about do what you can. You don't have to worry about having those hours in the morning or those hours in midday or waking up every day early to work out. You fit it in when you can. So I do stuff like I do push-ups in between things I'm doing. I do dips when I'm outside on the railings near my house. I use a stool to do reverse dips. If I'm, if I'm at the gas station, I'm doing squats while I'm pumping my gas. I mean, and that's look, and, and to me, it's not just about working out. What you can, when you can, is kind of it's it, it goes hand in hand with no let up. It's a life philosophy. So you know, people say, well, how do I do social? I don't have any time. Do you commute? Do you get on the train? Do you have any downtime? What time do your kids go to sleep? What time? You know, how much later can you stay up? What can you do to add to it? So you know, that's really what what we're talking about there, Rod. How about you? Well, you know, I believe everything you're saying. I mean, you know, I'm I'm all about. The, the notion that if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. <laughs> right? If I don't do the push-ups, somebody else is going to do the push-ups. They can't do them for me, so I've got to do it. If I don't create some content and, and share what I believe, somebody else is going to take some lesser idea and put it out there. So I have a responsibility to put my ideas out there so they can be shared and heard. And and uh, I think that's no let up. And it's, it's kind of – that's – that's the hard work, right? It's I, I I use the analogy that you know there are people with floaties in the pool and they're just having a drink and they're floating <laughs> on the surface. And the work that I do with the people that I serve requires a face mask, a snorkel, and a weight belt because we're going <laughs> we're going deep. You might need like some it. some fins too because we're going deep. I like I like it. Yeah, no, let up, baby. no let up, man. I need one of those. Yeah, well, you know, and I will tell you that I just ordered 200 of these, except the ones I ordered have the hashtag and have the exclamation point at the end. So come on the future shows. We'll be sending some of those out. 
All right. We're delivering some to Brian real soon. But you know, you know what? It's, it's interesting too, because I think, you know, part of this conversation is, you know, if someone's looking, hey, you know, I'm struggling. I need to, I need to, I need to start driving sales. I need to grow my business. When someone tells them you need to create more content or share more of other people's content, there is like, uh, I mean, they look at you with like you have four eyes and that doesn't make any sense. But I, I thought you said it very clearly there. Not only do you have to establish the thought, but you have to also kind of put things out there for people to know. I, I, I always use that, that, that phrase, you know, there is no excuse for people not to understand your story and know your value proposition in today's day and age. Maybe, maybe 10 years ago, you had the excuse if you didn't have the, the tools or you weren't living in the right city. And if you didn't live in the right city, you weren't connected to the right publications, the right PR person. But I think ultimately now we have the tools, the, the platforms and the, and the ability to tell our story, share that value proposition with no limitations. It just takes a crap load of hard work. Say, Brian, I, I'll, I'll build on that by saying that there's the, you know, thought leadership has been around for a while, a buzzword. It's, it's a bad word in many places. So I took it and I broke it in two parts. There's part A is thought. So my ideas are not different than Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. You know, because there's no new ideas. I just have to take responsibility for my ideas. The harder part, I think, is the leadership part. And that's when you have ideas, you have to accept the mental responsibility to lead with those ideas. And that's the hard work. That's no let up, right? And sure. um, that's that's what I believe. And, you know, I, 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 I want one of those armbands, Ted. I need a wristband. Right, okay, well, well come on, the, come on the show next week, or my email address is tedrubin at gmail.com. Shoot me an email, and we'll get one to you. Sounds awesome. good, man. I need, I need so to much. remind myself every day. Okay, man. Thanks. All right, I love it. You know, and I, it, it's a good thing. I liked his bio. Said he said, you know, sale. He has a, his art has a really good bio talking about brand and storytelling and the role of storytelling in sales. I think can uh, is often underestimated, especially in. The idea of how you tell your story, when you tell your story, where you tell your story so that you're actually heard. Uh, I did see a question uh, that someone had asked about, you know, how often do you recommend resharing content each week and what you post and repost? I mean, how do you answer that, Ted? I I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think a lot of it is about is about testing and retesting. Hold on a second. Just having a little technical difficulty. Okay. Um, so, okay, so you know, I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, you can't, you know, this you can only tweet X amount of times a day, or you can only tweet the same thing X amount of times a day, or you can only share it, you know, certain amount of days in a row." But I, I think it's all about experimentation. The beauty about what we do here is that you get immediate feedback, you know, and and I like to give things a few days, but I try different things. So what I will tell you is, that the more followers you have, the more often you can share something. OK, um, it, because remember that there's only a small percentage of people see on any platform that you're sharing on, see at any one time. And what I've learned is different times a day, different people are seeing it. Uh, um, different walks. I mean, now I'm different on different channels, so I'll tweet the same thing. Um, and I don't do this often, but I'll tweet the same thing 10 times on Twitter in, in a day. But I certainly won't post it 10 times to Facebook. Because I think, right. it's, I think it's a different experience. Also, because of that, people will tend to, I know I do, people, in, in my opinion, and people I've observed and watched, is they tend to scroll through Facebook and they'll look back at things you posted a, a few hours ago or a few days ago. Whereas on Twitter, there's only so much of that you can do. I mean, most of the apps don't even let you go that far back when I'm trying to find an old tweet or something like that and, and looking. So number one is, as far as what we were talking about earlier, there's two, there's two parts to this question, I think. Um, one part is you know, repurposing it and posting it on different platforms. I think you can do that as many times as possible. Uh, you know, I do it like Brian does. I tend to spread it out a little bit more, but it all depends on what the topic is and how, how um, time sensitive it is. But I'll post it. Usually I'm writing it for somebody else that will get posted on, on, their, on their blog. Um, my deal with anybody who I write for, who I get paid to write for, is that I need to be allowed, I co-own any of my content, um, and I will repost it to my blog. Um, very often, the rule is they like you to wait two weeks. Um, so very often, I'll wait two weeks, sometimes more. Um, it, it all depends, unless they ask me specifically to repost it earlier, because when it get re gets reposted to my blog, it gets a lot of distribution. So it all depends on how they're looking to do that. But for me, I like to spread it out, because I like to keep a post alive for a certain period of time. So my goal, and it doesn't work this way because I also have some people helping me who, who execute by you know posting it in different places, but I want it wherever it's being posted originally, two weeks later on my blog, a week or two later on Medium, HuffPo, 
um, CMO, um, the social CMOs and old blog, all my content gets posted to LinkedIn. And that way it's not getting, people aren't seeing it in the same week or the same day in multiple places. They're seeing it over time. But what I've also found is mostly you have a different audience in every different place. You so, so even though some people might see it more than once because they are following you everywhere and you do have that, you know, that, that core of people that are so into growing that they follow you everywhere, but the majority are only going to see it in one place. Or well, by the way, if they already read it and they liked it, they'll read it again. If they, if they read it and they got it, they'll just move on. It's not like they can't avoid it. It's not like you're putting a, 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 a video screen in their living room and you're blasting oh, yeah. the same thing over and over again. So and my, and my thing with that is pretty simple. You know, if it's crappy content, people yeah. will get pissed off that it keeps showing up in their feed. Exactly. If it's great content, nobody complains about getting too much great content. So I think that's a great point. So how's it going, Sandra? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm in a coffee shop, so I'm kind of dark, but um, I just want to I'm doing great. Hi, Ted. Um, hey, how are so- you, Sandra? Yeah, so good. So I just wanted to give um, a quick opinion on the thought leadership that you were talking about. Um, My opinion on the thought leadership was I really believe that it's about injecting our brand, our mission, our message into people every day. It's like a shot in the arm, right? Like it's flu season. So I'm just going to inject people with positivity. That's what I'm all about. And um, I wanted to just give both of you kudos, but just an example of Brian being a thought leader and how it touched me. He injected his message to me at um, Periscope Summit, the, the, uh, the we is greater than me. And what happened after that injection happened, I started telling people and then they started telling people and everyone came together as a community and they started talking about Brian. I talked about Brian online, one of my blabs, one of my blogs. So the injection is the first step. And then once the people start talking about you, that makes you become a thought leader. So that's just my opinion. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a great way of putting it. And I, you know, I think. It's good opinion. The only thing I, I just want to throw in one thing, that word injection just makes me very nervous. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, you know, not to up. there I go again. Uh, oh, my God. I was really scared. No, I'm just saying that it, it just puts a bad image in my head. Although It's I don't just a really pretend. Know. It's just a pretend much. needle. <laughs> okay, that's it's plastic. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, ahead, I Brian, actually think I, I always use the word amplification. right? And it says, you know, how do I amplify yes. my message? And for me, the greatest way for me to amplify my message is to provide value to everybody around me. And then as I'm sharing my message, everybody around me wants to share what I'm doing as well. Right. And I think that's, I think that's something that's often underestimated in the sense of, you know, that grassroots and people are like, well, how did you get this conversation to go viral? And I, I was blessed. I mean, the Periscope summit uh, keynote was without question. My, the most, the most, I'd say buzz I've ever got for any keynote. I've given stages four times the size, but it was really the audience that was there had connected. I had, I was working on building uh, trust and rapport with, and I was blown away. And it, all of it really had to do was taking, I, I had to take advantage of the opportunity I had to amplify a message that I thought everybody would believe in. And I think that is a lot of what this comes down to. I think it even comes down that when someone's great at selling, they're doing the kind of the same thing. They're just doing it strategically in a way with a, with a direct call to action. Like my call to action at the end was to find a way to show you care and let everybody in your community know the people that are doing social and doing Periscope correct. Yeah. And I think you know your call to action can be different if it's closing a sale, but you're right. I think that's a great point. Injection or amplification, whatever that idea is, is making sure your message is heard by the masses. Yeah, and I think the really cool thing was once that happens and once people make that connection, that's what makes you a thought leader because people start talking about it and they start spreading it. And that really is like a powerful thing. Once it starts going, that's free. You get yep. people to talk about you. So, um, so yeah, that's cool. And I'm really proud now because it's been years now I've been trying to develop my brand. Um, it started with my daughters and I. It's actually called Say It Forward. My company is called Say It International. And no let up. I'm telling you, it started in 2012 as a gesture. It, it, I've been just working at it. And finally, I've had people coming back now and saying, like, you're on fire. Keep going. So, nice. you know, you do want to sometimes maybe think am i doing the right thing it will just come into my mind for a minute and i just say screw this i'm going to keep doing it and people keep coming back and telling me you know what it's resonating with me i like your message so so i'm getting there too but i really admire you guys and i just wanted to uh to share that so thanks so much sandra have, well, have a good coffee for sure well, thank you. bye ted Here. hey i saw what happened to samantha i saw her trying to get samantha in here her phone's not letting her in 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe well, Blab already took off for TGIF. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't. You, you know what? When, when we're done, and I'm only mentioning this so other people can, you know, if they have the same problem. When I try to go into my laptop now, it's opening up and it's showing my picture, but it's t using the camera from my iPhone. So there must be something wrong with either the, either the Blab camera or something on my uh, my laptop. So we'll have to figure we'll have to figure it out afterwards. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So so yeah, I mean, and I I think you know this whole conversation and really what we were talking about today, Ted. You know, like uh, I also think it's really important and it can't be underestimated to have you know the the idea of not only when you're selling yourself or selling you know what your value is, but surrounding yourself with people that either <laughs> can support you or get you or or do things the the right way. Uh oh, we can't see your pizza on the cheap. Try again. Um, your camera wasn't working, but, um, you know, I think it's really, yeah, Samantha. Oh. Oh, Samantha was coming in, uh, it, but it's really important to also like, if you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to try to build this relationship and this rapport, you, when you surround yourself with people that are going to, you know, hold you up when times are tough or that are going to reach out, you know, you and I had a great conversation earlier this week and, and it was, you know, really a lot of things that are going on in my life that I kind of was like, Hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working on selling. And I can't tell you, I think that is so far underestimated because in the good times, you don't realize you need it. The bad times you wish you did. And if you do it throughout the middle, the good times and the bad times are both good when it comes to selling. And I think that hard work in the middle, the no let up atmosphere in the middle is ultimately what makes the bad times short and the good times long. You know, do for an expectation of anything directly in return. And what you'll find is you will get it in return. You know, and, and I don't know if you want to call it what goes around comes around. I don't know if you want to call it karma. I don't know if you want to call it reputation. But for me, it's like I find that people, when I reach out to people, you know, nine times out of ten, they say, you know, of course I'd be happy to help because I see you helping other people or I see what you do for others. And, you know, I just think that's so true. Hey, Sherry, what's going on? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> well, Glad to be here. I want to say two things. Number one, I think people forget, and part of what you're saying, what, what goes around comes around, is that they want to push stuff at you without maybe doing something for you. Because um, the best way to make connection is to, if you see some good content, pass it on. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I go into my feed every day and serendipitously share people's content. You know, I'm always sharing, you know, trying to help and support other people. I even have a, a new newsletter that goes out every Wednesday night uh, called Return a Relationship. And every week it's about featuring somebody else's content. Right, so, right. You know, it, and, and, well, you know, it also starts, it also includes what, not only what you share, but how you share and what you do. And I can tell you one of my secrets and I, and I love to, you know, for me, I would take something great I found from an influencer on Twitter and everybody and their, everyone that follows that person can hit the retweet button. That's the easy. You could hit quote retweet now, which I love that feature. You can add a little bit of insight, but you know what I would do? I would take it. I would post it on LinkedIn and I would add my own paragraph about my thoughts on it. I would tag them in it. And for me, it was that little bit above and beyond. If I want to stand out from the crowd, I, I can hit retweet. Everybody can do that. You can share. But when I add it and I'm kind of cro I'm doing it myself, and ultimately, like Ted said, there was no gain. There was no call to action from me in there. But I wanted to let people know I found this so valuable. I took an extra minute to post it on another platform or do it in another way. I think sharing, oftentimes people think it's the easy button. It's clicking the like, double tapping on Instagram, hitting retweet. But if you go above and beyond, I think that's when you stand out from the noise. Right. And then the, the second thing I sort of wanted to mention, for anybody who's questioning if they're having impact, I had an aha moment recently at the airport. Uh, I uh, was waiting to board the train. Hey, pizza on the cheek, can you mute yourself for a second? You know, because there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Oh, sure, right. man. Thank you. Yeah, but um, I had the, this aha moment. I'm I'm sitting there waiting for the plane, you know, uh, uh, to get on the plane, and this woman comes up to me and she says, "I know you," <laughs> and I'm thinking, "Okay, what did I do?" And then she says, "I read one of your articles that you posted, blah blah blah, and this that and the other," and I say that to simply say, sometimes. <laughs> you're not getting a lot of feedback, you know, and you become discouraged, okay? Uh, but just know, maybe people don't do comments, but 
you are having impact. And that was amazing for me because she could tell me the article. She told me what she liked about it and this, that, and the other. And she never commented. She never commented. So I say all of that to say, keep doing what you're doing. And yes, make adjustments where you need to. Let some of the numbers that you're getting sort of tell you, may, you know, what people are looking for or whatever. But even if you are getting a lot of feedback, you know, um, the numbers a lot of times will tell you that there's somebody out there and they're listening to what you have to say. Okay. I love that you said that. I love that you said that because uh, Gary Vaynerchuk posted a, a post, a uh, 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 picture, and it said, you know, it's it's not it's how you make your money, not uh, you know the money you're making that you will be remembered by. And it hit me at the exact right time. Like it was, just, I mean, it was it was uh, right on the head. And I posted on Facebook. I, I'll post the link out there. It's a it's a public Facebook post. And really, I posted it really sharing my own side because I, I I focus a lot on transparency. And I say, you know, too often I only show the the highlights, and I want to make sure that people know that there is, you know, and also I love that engagement and learning from people, but I, I, I sent a, 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 a simple Twitter video to Gary Vaynerchuk and Gary Vaynerchuk is someone that, you know, I don't like to always like put as someone that relates to because he is, he is kicking ass and taking names. He has his, I mean, his, his, but it's the hard work and hustle. And I, he, I love, he had a comment the other day was like, find a video on him on YouTube before he was 30. There isn't one because he didn't even start Wine Library TV. Those thirty-one. So anybody who says you're too old to get started or you didn't have the luck that Gary Vaynerchuk had, he started later. But the moral of the story was very simple. I sent him a Twitter video. It was thirty seconds, and all I said was, "Gary, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how often you see my posts, but I want to let you know that your post today really, really had a major impact on me. And you're you, you've had a lot of influence on what I do, but that post today hit me really good." And he replied back and then we went on private message back and forth and him letting me know that like as much as he knows he makes an impact and as much as he's excited about making a difference for him, just that little bit of personalization that I said, hey, you know, I really want it, it, it was a huge deal. We went back and forth for maybe 10 minutes and I've been very lucky to get a little bit of his time over time. But I think you have a great point. No matter how big you're following or how small you're following. It's, it's amazing when someone reaches back out and lets you know, hey, you know, you're doing great things. And that's, a, that's even a no let up call to action, right? Like return on relationships, my show you care, is it's that ability to go out of your way to let someone know they've impacted you because we've all have been in that case. And if you don't, that's also a great way to continue building a relationship, right? Because too many times people are like, Oh, those, of course, they're my favorite three people, but I don't even bother them. Those favorite three people might need a pick me up or a attaboy or a thank you for what you're doing just as much as everybody else does. And if you remember that, it'll come full circle. But I love that, Sherry. Sherry, I'm going to let Pizza jump in here. Thanks All so right, much. Bye bye. Cheers. Thank you, Sherry. All right, Pizza, you can un unmute yourself there. I think you're in your shop. So I think you're hey, yeah, listen, I'm also uh, talking to you from a coffee shop. All yeah, right. About 100 miles north of Philadelphia about a hundred miles from nowhere. And this place is real noisy with a roaster going on in the background. And one of the things that I wanted to say is that I get so, a lot of value out of these conversations on selling. I, I've been a sales guy for most of my life. And um, I, I, I just happen to think that uh, this new way of selling in social media is intriguing. Um, so I want to. Uh, I, I learned from Ted today. You got to experiment. You got to have an A, a B, a C, a D. Do whatever works. You know. And, uh, well, and I think you know one of my challenges always to people is how the hell do you know if it works or not if you haven't tried it? And everybody's audience is so unique. The audience is unique as you are unique. And I posted this quote out there because I firmly believe it. If people want to stand out from the crowd and make a difference. The only guarantee they have of being unique is them being themselves and trying it, right? So I don't care how many blog posts you read that say your 10 secrets to whatever the hell it is. It's ultimately your relationship with your audience and your ability to kind of embrace that and try and fail. And so I, I, and I, I agree with you on the idea that um, social selling is very interesting because the relationship that Ted talks about in, in, in his book that, it, that really hit home for me is the long game. Right there, it is definitely the long game, but there's also there's elements and things you can do along the way that can allow you to reach benefit uh, across the board as well. Ted, I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit or not. No, no, I, I agree 100. I, I love that. First of all, it's it's really hard to hear 
with what's going on in the background there. Um, but I will tell you that, um, look, there's so many opportunities here to like, try different things, to, to, to also remember that parts of your audience are going to like one thing, part of them are going to like another. And then one of the things I like to point out is, you know, we all use the word audience. It's just, it's part of our vernacular, but start thinking of your audience as an asset. Start, instead of thinking of them as just somebody who's listening to you, think of them as somebody that's adding value to what you're doing. And remember that you have to add value back. And to me, that's really where a lot of it's going to come in. And again, look at the long term, keep trying different things, keep seeing what works for you, because what works for you might not work for others. And don't take anybody who tells you that's not the way to do it if you find it's working for your audience. I've had people jump in and say, listen, I can't believe the way that you tweet so much or how many Twitter handles you have. You've got 12 Twitter handles. You know, that's ridiculous. I'm following all of them. I see every one of your tweets 12 times when you when you push it out to all your handles. And I say, and I listen to that. But then if I only hear two people say that, but more people say to me, you know what? I love when I see your tweets. I, I only follow three of your handles and I see your tweet three times. I never missed them. So, you know, there, there, there's all different outlooks to it. There's all different things that are working for people. And all in all, if you pay attention, if you listen, if you don't just post and walk away, you're going to know what's working. And then if you're willing to listen to your audience and adjust, and again, think of them as an asset and, and what's going to make it better for them and better for you. You know, I, th I think you're going to win and I think you're going to sell more and you're going to build your reputation. And, you know, and Brian's holding up right Bear's utility. I book, mean, this, so, this book had a huge if you're looking at content and you can't figure out how to create content or what content you should create or how you should share it. This book by Jay Bear right here. The reason it's so easily accessible behind my head is because it, it, it had a major impact on me, on the brands that I was working with on creating content of value that answered questions that provide inspirers for me are Marcus Sheridan and Jay Bear. Marcus Sheridan and Jay Bear really reframed my conversation on how I create content, where I share it, and how I do great things with it. And that also goes into the reason those books are on my shelf, the reason I talk about them is because it's sharing what I learned, but I'm not guaranteeing it, right? So like, so I, you know, jab, 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 right hook is another great one for understanding how to make it all work online. But uh, I think it's, it's an interesting conversation for sure. But thanks so much, my friend in the uh, pizza from the coffee shop in the middle of nowhere. Hey, like, <laughs> one, other, one, one other thing here. Uh, while we were while you were blabbing earlier, the owner of the coffee shop walked by and he saw the uh, topic and he says, here, why don't you see if you can try to sell some coffee? <laughs> so uh, look, at, anybody wants some Colombian coffee, which was just roasted. This is just right out of the roaster. What they want to do is they want to go to the form that I'm posting here in the comment tracker. Give me your name, your contact information, and I'll send you the price list for this great coffee. This is okay. unbel unbelievable okay. coffee for the middle of the afternoon. I love awesome. it. Thanks, Enjoy my friend. Enjoy it, man. Hey, Preston, you've been waiting patiently, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I know, Scott. Nice to see you, Ted. Brian, nice, nice to see you again. Yeah, cheers, Preston. How's it going? Good, good. I just <laughs> there comes Mike. Um, no, I just wanted to say about experimentation. Um, I've done that in Google for many, many years, and I'm continually doing it, as you can see. And it's, you know, like you said, not everybody's going to like what you do. And I already had a couple of people here on Blab that didn't like what I was doing here. They said it's too distracting. Um, but I'm also doing it to brand myself. It's different. Uh, no one else is really doing it. I have a certain industry that I'm looking for. And unfortunately, um, um, the owner <laughs> of Blab doesn't uh, put travel as a category yet. So it's more of, uh, I guess, trying to push him to do so <laughs> in a nice way. Okay. But, you know. I, I don't. I don't feel myself as an influencer. Uh, I'm still learning the game, if you will. I mean, I've been on the internet for many years, and I think it's. You know, I don't know if you know um, Kenneth Manis, Manisee Senior. Yep. But he, he's a good friend of mine, and he talks a lot about you know doing experimentation when you're doing marketing, because you never know what works, and then if you could find something that works, obviously you just duplicate that over and over. No, yep, for sure. I couldn't agree more. And Preston, you know, I think for me also, anytime someone tells me that people aren't liking what they're doing and then they're trying to do something unique, my question always back is pretty simple. 
What is the reason behind doing it? And you already answered that. And as long as you have a reason behind what you're doing, I say keep on doing it every time to every one of those people. Because the people that are just spraying fire and doing random crap for no rhyme and reason, they're the ones that ruin it for someone like yourself that is doing it with a strategy, a plan behind it, a goal, an agenda. And then your agenda doesn't have to be putting it in someone's face, but it wants to get noticed. And I, I say continue on. I, I, I love people that aren't, aren't afraid of failure and aren't, aren't willing to just listen to the haters who usually just hate what they don't understand, not hate for any other rhyme or reason. But well, thank you, you so know, much, Preston. Just remember something. It, it's so easy. If people don't want to watch it, they just won't tune in. I mean, to me, that's right. the beauty of social media. I mean, you know, all social is the ultimate in permission marketing. You don't like it, stop watching. You don't like it, mm -hmm. unfollow. You don't want it in your feed, don't pay attention, turn it off. So, you know, again, if people are tuning into whatever you're doing, then, and they like what you're giving them, then they have to take what comes along with it. And hopefully it's having the, the, the effect you're trying to make it happen. So, so thank, yeah, thank you so much, Preston. Thank you. So yeah, thank kudos you. to you. Later, man. Right. Mr. Baltus, I haven't seen you in a while, my friend. It's been a little long. Oh my God, Mr. Fanzo, how are you? And my good friend, Ted Rubin, Coming to you live from the Mile High City where shenanigans, where I first met you ever with Joel Calm right here at our shenanigans event that I helped uh, produce with Joel. Ted, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Right? You can see I, the Colorado I, sunshine is, you know, beaming rating, upon me, yes. man. <laughs> yes, you're, you're getting all of it. That's for sure. I know it. I love the conversation you guys are having today because it brings up a book that I always reference to everybody. It's from that one guy called Bob Berg, the go giver. You guys know him. Oh, yes, I have heard. I've heard of the book. I haven't read it though. Oh, are you kidding me, dude? It's, it's a nope. short read, very short book. That's about the size of my attention span some days of the week, you know, as a father <laughs> and a husband. So you got to You got to give it a read, man, because it really does go into seven very simple principles, including your true worth is determined by how much you give in value than you take in payment. And that's just one of the values that he rips out and he is given and he dispels. And I've had him, I've met him a few times, interviewed him and had him actually on our campus here at university when I was finishing my degree program. So he's, nice. he's one of those guys that would come into the classroom for us uh, via Skype and, and talk to the student body about entrepreneurship and giving of themselves, whether it be content, their value relationship, the value proposition, whatever it is, and that soft sell. So hopefully you get that 80, 20 rule where, you know, if you give out 80% value, 20% of that's going to be returned in a financial endeavor. So really good. I'm glad you guys are having this conversation. It's a powerful conversation to have and a great reminder to be humble sometimes too. Very true. Very true. <laughs> and I can tell you, it's a, it's an interesting roller coaster too along the way. That's for sure. I agree. I agree. Thanks Mike well. so much for jumping in my friend. Hey Mike, thanks for jumping in. Love the sweet voice, man. You you sound great. Nice <laughs> equipment. I mean, you, you talk like you're a radio guy. Mike is awesome. It. He's also on every, like on the live streaming, like he is because he's the opposite of me, like so fast that people don't even think I'm thinking. Everything comes out of Mike's mouth is always methodical, perfectly sounding. I mean, and then I, if you follow him on Snapchat, he's always in biking and all these beautiful scenery. I got to come out to Denver just to hang out with a guy because I'm, I'm a fan. But thanks so much, Mike. We're going to we're going to wrap up for this one. I have a call to jump on in three minutes with a client. Um, but, you know, Ted, I love the conversation. I love you know, that we're really talking about a lot of different things. This isn't a show about marketing. It's a show about life and where we're, you know, as a business, as an entrepreneur, as mentors, as a millennial, as a millennial mindset, as really what no let up means is, is you know, plugging on. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky, you know, no let up is something that I'm reminding myself of a lot more uh, the last couple of weeks than I had maybe beforehand. But it's, uh, it's definitely a great conversation. So I'll let you kind of wrap a bow on this and we'll send it out of here. Well, you know, I, I think you hit a lot of things. I just see Dig Tool Online made a mention about how great it is to, hey, you keep on keeping on, you know, get stuff done, no matter the haters or the failures. You know, I, I like to say, you know, I, I just, I, I embrace critics. I want to hear what they have to say. I try to showcase whatever it is they're talking about. To me, it creates conversation. Um, sometimes they, they, when I jump in with people who are disagreeing with me and I welcome their thought, they think I'm being uh, disingenuous. They think I'm not being authentic, that I really don't want to hear it, but I do. And part of that is that if you're open to hear other people's sides of things, it just shows that you're that much more committed to what it is you're doing and what you believe in when you're willing to answer the questions. And what you'll also find, and Brian and I, you and I were talking about this the other day on the phone, that when someone is out there like saying what you're saying isn't right, if you answer them logically, if you, if you come back to them with what you believe, whether you are facts and figures or whether you just have passion and belief, you know, eventually – 
when you give them what they want to hear, when they tell you you don't have case studies and you show them case studies, or when you, you they tell you that that what you're saying doesn't meet the data and you mention to them or you remind them how important judgment is, how important intuition is, how important experimentation is, you know, most of the times these people will end up going away or backing off or moving on to something else. And then you can keep on doing what you're doing with the support of the people that are in your community. So, you know, I like, again, I, I say this all the time, a network gives you reach and a community gives you power. And, and, and when you start thinking about that, when you realize the power that comes with, with supporting people, with working with people, with letting them know, and remember that networks connect but communities care. And we're building a community here, a community of people that know that it's all about never letting up, never giving up, pushing forward. And listen, everybody, make it a great weekend. No let up. And remember, next week, we're going to have some new no let up, hashtag no let up uh, wristbands. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll even give out some on the show. So, uh, yeah, And I put the link, for those of you that are in here still, I put the link in in the uh, in the comment section there. So it's going to be the very bottom comment. So go ahead and click on that. Hit subscribe. Even if you can't watch the show live, you'll get an email after the show goes off the air with a link to the show. So if you miss us live, you can't show up on a Friday. We understand life happens. So uh, make sure you subscribe to next week's show and uh, we will be back again next Friday. And I just want one last thing. Um, Brian and I are talking about how we can take this on the road. I know wherever Brian goes, he meets with people. I will be in Boston next week. I'll be in Atlanta the week after that. I'll be in Miami the week after that i'll be in salt lake city on 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 the 10th of december and want to meet with you guys anybody that wants to meet reach out and make it a great weekend and one last thing to my friend there brian fanzo when you're done with that call reach out to me i want to fix this problem on my laptop before we let it go too long all right sounds good okay man bye cheers guys